welcome everyone to our Romance Writers panel. Tonight we have Kathy Maxwell, Farah Roshan, Carmen Kelly, and Sophie Jordan. Kathy Maxwell has been in publishing for over 25 years. Over the course of that quarter of a century, Kathy has written over 35 historical romances, hit the New York Times and USA Today list, been nominated for or won some nice awards, made dynamite writing friends, and has had the time of her life. Her latest book has the old school title of His Secret Mistress and was out in February 2020, just in time to greet COVID. Welcome, Kathy. <laughs> Farah Roshan, USA Today bestselling author of The Boyfriend Project, hails from a small town just west of New Orleans. She's garnered much acclaim for her Holmes Brothers and New York Saver series. When she's not writing her in her favorite coffee shop, Farah spends most of her time reading, cooking, traveling the world, visiting Walt Disney World, and catching her favorite Broadway shows. Hi, Farah. Sophie Jordan grew up in the Texas Hill Country, where she wrote fantasies of dragons, warriors, and princesses. Former high school English teacher, she's also the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of Avon Romances and Young Adult Fiction. She lives in Houston with her family. When she's not writing, she spends her time overloading on caffeine, talking plot lines with anyone who will listen, and cramming her DVR through crime and reality TV shows. <laughs> Paranormal romance and urban fantasy author Karma Kelly has been enamored with things enamored with things that go bump in the night for who knows how long. She truly believes that finding humanity and beauty in some of the most seemingly unconventional places is part of the romantic psyche to her. She's the founder of the Inclusive Romance Project, a nonprofit organization focused on providing career growth and safe spaces for new and seasoned romance authors of underrepresented identities. She lives and writes in Round Rock, Texas with her spouse and her precocious pup who loves to swim. Oh, <laughs> hi, Karma. It's been a couple years since we've seen you at the library. So welcome back. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Kathy's also visited our library, but I missed mm -hmm. I was sick that day, but it's nice to finally get to meet you. Okay, I'm so we're ready. I don't want you to do it. <laughs> the fun one. So we're going to start uh, with Kathy, and I'm going to go down. Uh, hopefully, you all have the same order. Kathy, Farah, Karma, and Sophie. Uh, you started writing. Well, when did you start writing, and what motivated you to start your writing career? You know, I, um, I always wanted to write. Um, back when I was 25, I made a list of the 25 things I wanted to do in my life, and uh, writing, write a book was on that list, but I had no idea what I wanted to write. I refused to read romance novels back then. And um, I just, but this was a, a great list to set off and off I went. So I started writing. Well, first I got hooked on romance novels about the time I had my second child. And then it was like, I was desperate for anything to feed my imagination. And once I started reading, I just went, I went overboard. And I knew this is what I wanted to write. So in 1992 is when I started to write. I, that sounds like it's so far away. 1992. And I sold my first book. It came out in 1994. So I've been writing ever since. Wow. <laughs> uh, well, I'm kind of like Kathy in that I didn't uh, really read romance novels around the time that I started writing. I, I kind of read them when I was younger. But when I decided I wanted to be a writer, I was reading more, sorry to say this, but important books. I think so ridiculous. <laughs> but it was all the Oprah books that, you know, make you cry and um, suspense thrillers and things like that. But um, my sister gave me a copy of Laverne Spencer's Separate Pits. And I absolutely fell in love. And I've been writing romance since. It's not what I thought I would be doing. I was a psychology major. And I don't think my dad has ever forgiven me for finishing grad school. And literally the week after I finished, I told my parents, OK, I think I'm going to try to be a writer. Um, <laughs> and that's when I seriously started to pursue it. Um, and yeah, I've been doing it, uh, like Kathy said, ever since I sold, you know, I, I joined a local writers group and sold my first book about five years after that. And I've just been going ever since. That was in 2000, 2007, I think, is when the first one came out. Karma? 
Oh yeah. So I've, I've always written, um, I think one of the, I, I definitely did not start writing romances first. I wrote, I was a humorist. I was a big Mark Twain fan when I was a kid and liked to write uh, humorous essays. And so I would get in trouble in school because I would, instead of writing my assignment, I would make satire um, and crazy fun essays and make my classmates laugh with with that stamp. But that was my thing that I really like to do as part of my release. And uh, my best friend, her mother had uh, a subscription to those uh, those romance novels, so they send you like a pack of them, like you know, come through one a month. And she would take them, and she would steal them, and she would sneak them over to me, and we would like read them. And so uh, at first, it's funny. Like I started reading historical romance because that was a lot of what her mom liked to read. And then um, a friend of mine had gave me a copy of uh, Sherilyn Kenyon's. Uh, Night, and I read that, and I was just completely enthralled with like paranormal. People write this kind of stuff, like this is great, and you know, and this was from like me growing up watching like Buffy and Angel and like all those shows on like CW and what have you. Um, so from then on, I was hooked and just started writing uh, paranormal romance and urban fantasy has kind of been my thing because uh, I like all the world building and being kind of weird with it. Um, and my first book was published in 2016 and oops, still kind of my thing. Sophie. Okay. I am you. Hey, everybody. You know, I feel like I was late to this. I, I was continue my and I started reading. Um, there really wasn't no collection, but I was reading Be Dalton. There's a flashback. <laughs> and browsing Be Dalton's and finding um, stuff on the novels. So there was all the Sweet Valley High. I don't know if anybody remembers Norma Klein, but she's a young adult novel that very true slice of life, like really graphic. And from there, I just started reading a lot of adult. Like, I read a lot of John G. I read the whole you know, South trilogy. I read the American Revolution series. I read The Bastard. I read it's probably one of the kids walking around in, my, in eighth grade with a copy of John G. The Bastard. And I think I just really liked to be carrying that for, you know, the shock factor of the book, The Bastard. But, um, I just started writing before I realized what fan fiction even was. Before the term fan fiction existed, I was doing it. You know, whether it was a Sweet Valley High book or a uh, Stephen or I had a mother and her had grown inspiration. So I don't know why a lot of people sort of fell into it. And there was also that part where it felt like this, um, Forbidden thing, or like we're doing a secret. I remember my mother the Harlequin boxes in the mail every month, also. And I remember taking them, thinking she wasn't gonna approve. And I, she didn't care. <laughs> hey, I remember that was romance. My mother never did not care. Uh, and then in high school, she found some drafts I was writing. It was full on romance. She didn't care either. <laughs> she read them and enjoyed it. So I just think um, I thought that people that, you know, took over got to college, got to, you know, college and social life. And I went to law school and I, it, it never me. I felt like there was 10, maybe even 15 years where I didn't write or entertain the notion of writing at all because I was just so busy living life. Uh, I started a family. And then I remember at seven months, my daughter had stopped nursing and was sleeping through the night. And suddenly I'm home alone with her. And I feel like I have all this time. And I'm like, I'm going to write a book. Remember how I used to do that thing? How I used to write? And um, yeah, so I don't think I started writing again till. I think there was a gap between 1992 and 2003. I never wrote a word. And then I came back to it when 
I suddenly had that time to do it and decided, you know, I'm going to finish a book. I started many books as a prepubescent and a teenager. I'm going to finish a book. And that book, I still, that was the first book I finished. Wait, where's my bookshelf? This was the book I started when my daughter was seven months old and I finished it and I sold it the first uh, it took three or four years to sell it. There was a lot of revising, but this was the first book I sold. So uh, I think it came out around 2005 or six. I'd have to look in there, but that's sort of my, my journey. I just think it's interesting. I mean, when people ask how I came to be a writer, you, anybody can be a writer. We all come from different fields. There's, you know, people who went to college who didn't go to college, people who are in the sciences, people who are in the arts. You could, Anybody could do this. That if you know, if they want to, we're all different. So who's next? <laughs> <laughs> all right. This question uh, is for all of you. What qualities do you think make for a compelling hero or heroine? And we'll start with Kathy. Okay. All right. Am I? Did I unmute, unmute myself? Did I do that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Because we can hear you now. <laughs> you know, that's the problem with Zoom calls. I find myself just talking a mile a minute and everybody's looking at me like, and I think I'm being pithy and wonderful, and instead I'm being silly. So I, I never want to have that happen. What makes, to me, what makes a, a fabulous um, hero or heroine? Um, I, I think that one of the, the, the parts about romance novels, I think people get wrong. As a lot of times they think it's about the sex. The sex is sex, and it's not. It's about the personalities. It's about that, that extra special something that each of us goes around looking for in life that means that this person is the person that I'm so this is my person. This is this is I'm gonna bond with this person. And so I, you know, some of the qualities I find are a sense of humor. I love it, a, a hero and heroine that has a sense of humor. Uh, I love them where they're they're healthy and active and um, and I I also like kindness in people. You know, just, I th I think kindness is an underrated quality. Uh, even when they're um, what you know that we, we're getting a lot of alpha heroes. I don't know if everybody understands, but the strong strong hero that you know is a little bit rigid or whatever else. But if there isn't an element of if he doesn't feed kittens. <laughs> when he finds them along the sidewalk, then he's, I, 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 I don't even want to know him. I don't want to know him. But if he's rigid and he has a mind of his own, but then he turns around and he shows kindness to others, that, boy, that melts my heart every time. So what else do y'all think? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the kindness has to show up eventually. Um, I, I think it has to be someone that your reader can empathize with even if they don't like them in the beginning, because, you know, one of my favorite tropes is the wraith or the rogue that comes, you know, that you don't really like him in the beginning. But I think that the there has to be the sense of empathy uh, in someone that your characters, you know, um, that your readers can maybe relate to or see a bit of themselves in eventually. Uh, so that's what I think makes a character for me. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And I think to piggyback off that, you know, I I have a a pet peeve around uh, heroes and heroines that are written too perfect. Um, I don't think that <laughs> that makes for a very interesting novel uh, to begin with. And two, it is hard for us to actually relate to characters like that, right? Like we're we're not perfect, and so I appreciate the. Uh, the humanism that is supposed to be portrayed in your hero and heroine into which they are going to make mistakes. Like granted, you don't want your, you know, your hero and heroine to be someone who is too, too, too stupid to live. Right. But you also want them to know, like you want to read someone of that who's capable of making mistakes because that is the whole part of like the character development. Like it is okay for them to have some of these flaws and issues that annoy you at the beginning. The goal is they grow from that by the end of the book. Like that's what you want to be able to see. Yeah, there's every, there's nothing that has been said that I don't agree with. I agree with everything everybody's saying a hundred percent. I think 
what I try to keep in the forefront of my mind when I'm starting a book, crafting the hero and the heroine is as someone is, is the empathy factor. But I really think the, the more books I've written and the more I think about it, and the, I try to come at it with, I always take a moment and kind of breathe. I take a few days when I'm starting a new book and I'm like, I remind myself of my favorite books, the ones I liked, the ones that resonated for me. And then asking myself why they resonated so much, like really. And I think when you do that, you come to know yourself as a reader, you come to know yourself as a writer and what works for me and what really resonates for me, of course, is seeing myself, right? As someone has said already, I'm seeing myself on the pages um, creates that empathy. And um, especially because they're, they're making these mistakes. There's conflicts. They're doing things wrong. It's so easy to forgive them if you like them <laughs> when they're doing <laughs> huge mistakes and these bad things. You, you want to like them first. So that's what will keep your reader hanging in there for the end. And um, I've had a good, I've had, a, I've critiqued mi many, many years with Tara Lynn Childs, who writes YA. And she's always kind of kept me on the straight about that. If I begin Oh my gosh, if you try to write in Enemies to Lovers, I've done a couple. They're very hard. They're very difficult to write. I enjoy them so much, though. But they're so difficult to write because you're writing a, two, a hero and a heroine or, you know, just two characters that are at such tremendous odds. They don't like each other. They hate each other. So then you're writing them being really not nice to each other. So it's tricky to uh, um, try to plant those seeds or those put those, them in scenarios where the reader is going to be on their side and like them. Mm -hmm. My biggest rewrite was an enemies to lovers. And I remember after I did it, I was like, I'm not going to do that again for it. Really. It just was a long time. It was a while. I just needed two or three years <laughs> to recover from the rewrite of an enemies to lovers. You know, one of the things <laughs> I can jump in here, Betty, and, and there's more and more romance novels are being made into movies. Uh, many of the Hallmark movies, I think Farrah, uh, The Boyfriend Project, I think is going to be a movie. We got the Bridgertons, Juliet Quinn's historical Regency romance series, The Bridgertons. And I'm excited because this is, this is going to give more people the opportunity to see the great characterization that's in romance novels. Mm -hmm. And so that we can kind of, you know, I, grab some respect or whatever it is that that uh, we want. And, you know, it's also fun to see these characters come to life. Yeah, I was watching the trailer for that and it looks, I mean, it looks like it's going to be an amazing show. It looks like they put a whole lot of effort and money and, and thought into this. So it looks very exciting. But as I was watching the trailer, I was thinking, why isn't, why is this the first kind of thing, the first type of show like this that I'm seeing really that they put so much marketing and effort into when you have, you know, books made thrillers and suspense novels and comic books and every other genre, but not romance. So I hope that this is a trend um, and that we see more shows like this, but related to that, um, yeah, <laughs> if you could cast one of your books, have any of you done like casting for any of your characters? <laughs> I've done it all the time, but it's, for me, it's not necessarily I just go looking for people online. Like some of, I always have a vision of the characters and uh, I have no idea if those people can act or not. You know, I've mentioned several times doing these things that my hero is based on a football player, ex-football player. Uh, his name is Will Demps and it is literally his face that's on the cover because he was my Daniel. And I have absolutely no idea if he can act or not, but I would love it if my book, I don't know if my book is ever going to get made into a movie. I would love that to happen as well. Um, but if it were to happen, I would love for Will Demps to play it because he was the inspiration just because he's very pretty. Um, so that's what I go. I'm very shallow and I go for that perfect face for my characters. Um, but that's part of the fun in, for me. It's not something I did in the beginning. But um, as I started to do it, and I put a Pinterest board together and all of this stuff to put their personality, you know, I do their apartment, all of this stuff. I realized that it really helps me bring the character to life once I start writing the book. So it's one of the fun parts of putting the book together for me. Okay, so my next question uh, is for Sophie. 
Your latest series is the best-selling The Rogue Files, and you've released two titles in that series this year. Uh, I love that the heroine in the novel, The Duke Effect, is a scientist. Did you have a real-life inspiration for that character? Um, not myself, because I'm not <laughs> very good at science. <laughs> but, um, yeah, she was an herbalist, and honestly... Um, so this is the Duke effect that came out this week. Um, the series, for a little background, it was a seven book series that it just started. I didn't mean for it to be seven books, you know, where it started. I have them here. I brought them. Ah, here's my tower of my seven historical novels that I never expected to be a series. But Nora, who was who's in the Duke effect, is a sister. These are the three sisters, and she was first introduced and this book and she was an herbalist and she was funny and she was quirky and she just really was extraordinary for her time in the sense that you know she really wasn't used to interested in the things other girls her age were interested in not interested in starting a family and having children um but in i don't know why i one of my favorite old school romances and i a lot of these were books i read as a 12 13 year old so they serve as still like a bedrock for me and inspiration for me. And I was reminiscing about Secret Fire by Ju Johanna Lindsay. If you remember that one, Kathy's making a face, she does. In Secret Fire, the heroine takes an aphrodisiac and it is given to her against her will. And cause you know, there was dubious consent in some of those early historical romances. So she takes an aphrodisiac against her will. And the hero, of course, has to help a gal out and um but in the johanna Lindsay version like if she's not satisfied i think there's a line by a servant go saying something like if she's not satisfied she could die <laughs> or if she doesn't get relief we may have to use the horse <laughs> like crazy crazy stuff <laughs> so of course in the secret fire it's the hero and he's mad at the servant for giving it to her but still it's you know she doesn't really it's a physical thing. It has to happen to save our life, kind of. So I was like, it would be really funny if I could, how could I incorporate an aphrodisiac into a story and have the heroine where she normally wouldn't want that hero, of course, want that hero, and then handle issues of consent? Well, it, it came down to Nora, who's my herbalist, because she's always mixing tonics and experimenting with things in her lab. She's this mad scientist. So her sister has really bad PMS and she's like, I've been experimenting with this pain reliever, this pain to help mitigate. I'm going to cure PMS, which I thought was kind of funny to deal with in a historical romance because they don't talk about PMS and historical <laughs> romances typically. So Nora's just, in, it, she's my heroine that thinks she's on the road to inventing a cure for PMS. And she inadvertently creates an aphrodisiac and gives it to her sister who then has to, you know, who attacks their house guests in the middle of the night. So it's crazy bonkers, but that's sort of what I, I have fun with writing those totally crazy situations. So um, when the book comes with the Duke effect, she's still in there mixing tonics and trying to figure out ways um, to fine tune her, um, pain reliever without, you know, making the people overcome with passion. So <laughs> making them feel really good. But, uh, yeah, I think the only thing is I just kind of did a little research on some herbs and things. Um, I was curious enough to think uh, the more I started thinking about it, I'm like, why wouldn't a woman like this want to go to medical school? It seems where Nora would be headed, but it was interesting reaching, researching a lot about medical schools. They came to the UK at a different time that they came to the United States. I think France was the first country that admitted females into medical school. Um, Cause that's ultimately, I think, see, I don't want to spoil the whole book, but yeah, that's where she might be headed you know, if she can. Um, so I don't know. Did I kind of answer your question? I don't, uh, <laughs> I've never written a science person though, like a sciencey character like that before. So that's also something I think that helps with writing is um, to keep you going through the years. If you're looking for longevity in your careers, you got to kind of keep um, evolving. I don't know. I can't keep writing the same book. It would be super boring, right? All of you. <laughs> um, 
question is for Farah. Uh, the buzz around the boyfriend project was huge. Um, we love the friendships between Samaya Taylor and London. Um, I loved how strong and creative Samaya was. Um, and he really took us into the tech world. Um, so for that character, was there a real life inspiration for that? Because I really felt like I was in that world. And also, I was wondering if you spent a lot of time in Austin because a lot of the places that I recognized were in that book. And I was like, she's a really good researcher or she hung out here. Uh, I actually lived there for a few years. That's why. <laughs> um, it's also why I decided to set the book in Austin because I knew the city. I knew it was a tech city. Um, and I don't see many books set in Austin. And it's such a cool town. You know, most of my things, because I'm from the New Orleans area, so I usually write about this area or like New York, where, you know, another city I love that people know. But I realized not many books are really set in and around Austin. And because Samaya was a techie, it fit so well, um, but it still required a ton of research because Austin has changed a lot in the 10 years since I lived there. Um, and I'd only been back once since. Um, so I did, I had to research uh, the town again, the town, the city. Um, I had to research the city. Uh, you know, I came back and did a couple of days just going to different places. Um, and also her job, because I too am not a tech person, but when I was in Austin, I actually did work. I was like the office manager at a small software firm. So I kind of had that as the bedrock, but I had to do a ton of research on, you know, she's developing an app in the book. Daniel has a very cool job that I can't really say what it is um, that required a ton of research because I had no idea about uh, this place where he works or this entity that he works for. Um, and it's it's like Sophie said, you know, you you don't want to write the same book over and over. People always say, write what you know, but you only know so much. You eventually have to write characters and scenarios that you don't know. And it just requires a ton of research. Um, so, yeah, it, it did. Uh, basically, everything I do now, um, you know, it just requires a lot of research to make it authentic. So that's what I tried to do. And I, I it took a lot with this book because there was so much and I wanted to get it right. And it was one of the longer books that I've written because um, I used to write for Harlequin. So I was used to, you know, 50,000 words, not really a lot of time or space on the page to get a lot of that story in outside of the romance. So I had fun actually exploring uh, Austin and Samaya's background and, you know, her life as a person, person of color in the tech world and just getting into all of that that I get into in the book. All right. I do see a couple of questions, so I'm going to make a note of those. Um, but I've got a question for Kathy. Um, your new series is the Logical Men Society's Guide to Dangerous Women. Um, and you've released the, your book earlier this year for that. Um, His Secret Mistress. What can you tell us about the Logical Men's Club and the ladies they encounter? Ah, well, um, the idea behind the Logical Men's Society is that it's an organization just for men who are single. So, you know, some men go out and they get married and then they have to drop their membership. Um, it's it's good natured. It's good natured. But then when they are widowed, then they can can come back into society. It's, it started off as a joke. Uh, well, some men think that, you know, they're they're being funny about the fact that women seem to want them to be married. And it, of course, this is set when it was first started. It was like in the in the Georgian era. So in the 1700s. And so, of course, it was very important for what, what is it? Every man should be married. Every woman, if you're worth your salt, you should have a husband sort of thing. So they had this and they, they celebrated being bachelors. And the idea behind uh, the Logical Men's Society meeting the dangerous women, I think a woman is dangerous when she knows her own mind. Up until that time, you know, for all of us, we're just kind of blithely, we're coasting through life. But when we get to that point, when we know what it is we want to do, that's also when we become the most interesting that we can possibly be. So, so the idea of meeting the dangerous woman is they meet women who just aren't that impressed with them and just have other ideas than just blindly following the marriage and, and just 
playing a role instead of being accepted as partners. And isn't that the best marriage? The best marriage, marriage is one of a partnership. Great. Karma, this question is for you. Uh, I was browsing the other day and saw that there's a new Agents of the Bureau book coming out this month. Can you please tell us about the men of the Bureau? Uh, yeah. So, I, ironically enough, even though it's a, a really um, hot, beefy guy on the cover of this book, um, he's not the member of the um, the uh, Bureau per se. But um, I would say... The men and the women, because this story is about um, a fae, uh, Leto, who is in the first book of Tall, Dark, and Deadly. So that's my first um, installment of uh, this universe for the Agents of the Bureau. And I wanted to create a bunch of characters. Well, first, I, I grew up watching a lot of cop dramas. And when I'm talking about cop dramas, we're talking about Steven, like, Botko all over the place and Dick Wolf. Like, all of those uh, dramas of, like, NYPD Blue and, like, X-Files and all these stories about, like, FBI partner cop stuff. And I wanted to have that same kind of relationship in a, a paranormal world. Like, I, you know, why, why couldn't I have a... a like FBI for supernaturals, right? Like there's going to be tons of creatures of all like backgrounds and from all kinds of cultures that exist in this world, right? In this shadow world. And um, you can't just let them just run loose, right? Um, it doesn't always going to work out. There's going to be some conflict um, as most things happen uh, with a bunch of uh, different people involved in each other's spaces. So I wanted to create a mix of different characters that would have their own like love story and adventure story around that world. Like if there is a, a bureau, then you're going to have fays, you're going to have vampires, you're going to have gins, you're going to have tons of these type of creatures who are all working together to try to keep everybody in line. So that was just rife for one gave me so much flexibility to create a slew of diversity in my characters um, because there's, I have books full of folklore and stuff. And anyone who's watched uh, uh, Supernatural knows that there's tons of lore to play with. So um, I had wanted to play in that world. And so I think there's always going to be a mix of, you're going to have your alpha heroes. You're going to have your, um, I guess you would call the cinnamon roll heroes, the ones who are so, so sweet that you just want to punch them in the face. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the, so case in point, uh, the men of the Bureau, like the hero in Tall, Dark and Deadly is Ethan, who is who had started the Bureau thousands of years ago. He's a lot older than he seems and there's a lot of mystery around him, but um, he's pretty much a very like cinnamon roll uh, kind of hero. This guy who's going to be with Leto, there is going to be a more of an enemies to lovers setup um, because Faye and vampires just don't mix. Um, however, uh, the first thing that have ever happened uh, in the history of uh, Fadum is uh, Leto, who has who is royalty in the Faye society, but decided to leave that behind so she can go fight crime with Ethan. Uh, got a summons from the Magi that she is to be mated. And lo and behold, the person that our character that she's supposed to be mated to is this surly, burly vampire that belongs to a rival um, organization. So that is kind of like the crux of all that. So you're going to see a mixture of different personalities and just wonder like, wow, some of these people got a lot of baggage. Um, <laughs> in the end, uh, everyone's going to have that happy ending. <laughs> So I want to know from everybody, um, who are some of the favorite people that you like to read? Not just for inspiration, but just period. Like, you know, other than yourselves, obviously. But who do you kind of like go to to just kind of escape or like when you need a little recharge to write? Maybe maybe that's two questions, but whichever one you want to ask, answer first. Hey, I'm going to jump in right here. Because I am crazy about Alexis Hall. 
And uh, he wrote the book, The Boyfriend. Now I'm going to get confused with Farrah's topic. Boyfriend Material. But he wrote The Boyfriend <laughs> Material. She wrote The Boyfriend Project. You know, because I, I, I would keep going back and forth and everything. Um, we have a book group here in Austin for romance novels. So Farrah came with The Boyfriend Project. And uh, she, she and if anybody wants to join, just email me, Kathy at KathyMaxwell.com. And I'll send you an invitation. But it's a lot of fun. And then, um, then this coming, we're going to be the boyfriend material. And he has gotten me so excited. I also read his book, The Affair of the Mysterious Letter, which is steampunk meets Sherlock Holmes meets Lovecraft. And I was thinking about him when Karma was talking about this new series that, that she's doing. I am really crazy. And the other one I, I, I want to enjoy, by the way, Everybody on the panel, I've read everybody, and they're all wonderful writers. I'll put in my plug right there for them. But um, the other one, and I'm going to kill her name so you guys help me, it's uh, Alina Kiebert. She writes for Harper Collins for Avon, and she wrote Get a Life, Chloe Brown. And it has been, it was just absolutely charming fun about a woman who, um, she suffers from fibromyalgia. And she's decided she's tired of people acting like she's sick. And she's tired of not having romance. And she's not, ha she just, she's ready to, she's just ready to go and take her control of her life. And it's funny. Uh, it's set in London. It's it just, a, a real, maybe it's not set in London, but it's set in England. It's very enjoyable. I really enjoyed her. And uh, yeah, you don't, I mean, I'll go on and on about people. But Alexis Hall <laughs> and Natalia Hebert have both, um, just sent my my reading boomerang or bell just going bing 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 it's sophie are you going because you're muted <laughs> there you go <laughs> it's all right so you go you can, all right. Uh, I was going to say Diana Quincy has a relatively new book out. Her Night with the Duke is just amazing. And I um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, my husband is half Lebanese. Diana has written, I don't know, probably one of the first historical romances I've read with an Arabic heroine in England. And it, it was just really great. Um, it was I was excited to read it. And, you know, I put it aside for my daughter who actually likes romance novels she went she did the same thing i did she read a lot then she suddenly got a car and then you know so i think her life's just on pause and i know she'll come back <laughs> i have all these saved for her i i when i released when my young adult novel released the summer i did an event with a well a virtual event because you know my book came out on june 6th i think it was <laughs> you know um Liara Tamani. She's a Houston area author as well. Um, and it's a young adult, but it's, it's it's largely a romance YA. And it was just a beautiful book. So I have, I grabbed this off my shelf. So I'm recommending that one. Historical romance, Diana Quincy. I'm a big fan of Joanna Shoup just because she writes in that Gilded Age era that I don't think, I, I didn't know I loved Gilded Age until I started reading in the Gilded Age where her heroines are like, a tennis pro and you know different things but it's historical so that is just a it's like um familiar it has all those things i love about historical romance while being really different in a different era so those um those are my three recommendations right now so. um for me i have i have my comfort reads which are all the old school uh you know, writers who I go back to, uh, Judith McNaught, um, Sandra Brown. I still read Sandra Brown, even, you know, her newer ones, but her older books, like Laverell Spencer, who I mentioned. Um, so I have those books that I go back when I want to, like, refresh my well. Um, but some of the authors that I'm really enjoying now, um, I read a lot of mysteries, and there's an author... Rachel Howells Hall. She has uh, some great books. She has this great series um, featuring, uh, it's a police procedural featuring a black woman who's a detective with the LAPD, uh, her Lou Norton series. It is so great. Um, and then another writer, Sharina Harris, she writes 
kind of in the vein of like a Terry McMillan, um, like a way to exhale her book. I'm perfectly happy. Um, and then she has a new one out that just came out on the 27th, I think, called Judges Girls. They're more of a women's fiction type books with a little romance in. I've really enjoyed her work. So those are two, you know, two that I'll turn to. And I didn't, I have like, you know, big names like Karen Slaughter, who's very dark. Um, but I, I absolutely love her Will Tritt series. And those people are the ones that I go to. Uh, I think some of my go to so yeah, my just like Farrah said, there there's there's some ones that you don't mind rereading or sticking to those same type of authors. So um Miss Bev, um I'm sorry, everybody know her as Beverly Jenkins, but her books help me get through the day sometimes. <laughs> uh great, great work there. Um I read um I, I still lean back on Sherilyn Kenyon and her Dark Hunter series at the very beginning, kind of a little bit after Asheron, I kind of just taper off, but still love her world building. Um, Shelley Lawrenston has really great paranormal work. Um, I love her series too. Um, I think the one that's new that I'm really excited about, I had just bought it, but um, it's the Nightmare Verse um, universe by L.L. McKinney. So she does a blade so black and I've just been hearing nothing but good things about it. And I love anytime there's a twist on like old stories, like this is a twist on Alice in Wonderland. Um, I'm, I'm just totally on board with it. I think it's going to be awesome. And anything around like elaborate, whimsical and crazy world building, I'm all for it. All right. It looks like for some reason, all the chat questions are going to me. So I have to scroll up and look. <laughs> um, but we have a question from Jenna for everyone. Uh, do you have any words of wisdom on self-publishing versus traditional publishing? Oh, wow. So many feelings. <laughs> yeah. Do we have, who, who else is hybrid? Am I the only hybrid? Yeah. Okay. So he is too. Um, because I, I've done both. Um, and you're going to work no matter what. Uh, <laughs> so, but it, it really, in my opinion, it depends on what you want out of your writing uh, or your career. Because, you know, I was traditionally published at first because it was before all of that. And I learned so much from like the editors. Um, and I think that helped me in particular because I'm kind of stubborn. And when I first started, I thought my words were gold. And I just know how I am. If I had not started traditionally, I would have put the first thing I wrote up on Amazon and went with it and thought it was the best thing ever. So personally, for hard-headed Farah, having a traditional <laughs> publisher with an editor who told me my words were not gold, um, that was good for me. Uh, but, you know, I think people have come a long way since then. people know that they have to get editors and top editors and all of these things, no matter how they're publishing. And I think if you approach it as a business, um, don't go in with expectations that are out of this world because the market is extremely flooded and it takes a lot to stand out no matter how you're being published. But, you know, Manage your expectations. Make sure you're putting out your very best work, no matter how you're being published, and you'll do fine. I mean, it's it's absolutely uh, both are, you know, both paths are absolutely legitimate. So, and and not only and not only that, it's all good. Yeah, as long as you're following your dream, as long as you're writing and you are going in the direction you want to go, good things are going to come. Uh, and they'll just, you may feel like it's not going to happen. Trust me, it will It'll just all of a sudden fall into your lap and you'll think, oh, I wasn't expecting that. So, yeah, I think both everything totally, I everything said, um, just definitely approach either way, either way you're going, um, you're a professional, you're a writer, uh, 
don't ever, I always felt like even aspiring authors who haven't published yet, be it traditional or indie, sometimes hesitate to even call themselves a writer. And I never thought that was right, you know, correct or fair. You know, if you're out there and you're, you're putting in the work and you're crafting your book, maybe you haven't gotten to the business stage yet because you're still writing it and crafting it, but you're a writer. That's, that's what you are and that's what you're doing. Um, you know, I didn't become hybrid until I was already established in traditional. So I feel like I probably, you know, you know, Farah, you, you did indie first, you know? So, I mean. No, actually I was, I had about 15 published before I, yeah. So I'm about the same way. Then we're in this together. So um, the thing that I just want, it is going to be work whichever way you do it. Um, But the thing that's really exciting is that if you're doing something different and a little out of the box, and maybe traditional publishers don't want to take that chance on it, or you, I think it's very exciting and heartening to know that then it's not, that's not the end of your story. If you sell it traditionally, because it's just, it's a little out of the box, it's a little different, you can still publish it and still put it out there. If there is an audience, I'll go back, I will say that, um, that new adult publishing, at least that age of between high school and being a full adult, like a 30, you know, that early mid twenties, that never traditional publishing didn't, you know, didn't want it. It wasn't a thing until indies blew it up and suddenly mm-hmm. now want to write a heroine that's 20 or 21 or that's sort of maybe just an ill-defined genre. Like you can't, you know, I, sometimes I talk to someone and I'm like, I'm like, so what are you working on? It's a new writer. And they're like, what to call it like it's sort of with a little women's fiction but it's maybe a hit of four, this tiny paranormal I think that's great those are the books that bust out of the gate because they're defying all genre and doing something fresh and different and and if you can't sell it traditionally well you can still find an audience to put up in it. yeah karma what advice do you have yeah I think I think I'm the only one in this panel that has been like full on started out with self-publishing. So I would definitely say too, like um, agree with everyone, uh, what everyone has been saying, Uh, whatever path, like there is no wrong path. The only wrong path is you not taking any path at all and not writing and just sitting on that book. Um, (laughs) That is what I would say is the wrong path. Um, But I would say that my, my learning experience. So I didn't know anything about, um, publishing when I, I, I got started with my first book. Um, I did lots of reading and lots of research and tried to figure things out, but um, there was a lot of trial and error specifically around marketing, which is everyone's kind of like uh, like Satan in a Sunday hat kind of thing. Um, but I would say learning that has will be skill set for whichever path you choose because I mean, I'm sure everybody will nod their heads here in this panel, regardless of what path you take, you're going to need to know about some marketing. Um, that is not going to be completely like off your hands as an author. Um, you're still going to need to know how all that works. You're still going to need to be able to put in some time. Granted, you're not going to need to put in as much time if you're traditionally published because you do have some support there. Whereas self-publishing, it's really all on you and being able to find like other experts that you can leverage um, to, to help. So my, my advice is don't be afraid of that. Um, that is a very powerful skill set to have. And just like Farrah said, like this is, is a business um, and your books is a product. I know we want to say that there are babies, but at the end of the day, they're, they're a product. Um, so I think as long as you're approaching it as not taking every single failure as for an excuse to just not continue, but just considering that this is a learning environment, this is a learning experience, and I'm just going to get better with the next book and the next book and the next book. You just got to keep doing it. Um, but yeah, that is my advice to go for it. Like, sometimes just got to get in there and do it. <laughs> I also think that when you're first starting or even, you know, even at my point in my career, it helps to interact with other writers. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's been that's been very important. I learn from other writers. A writer's going to tell me more over a cup of coffee than they will, you know, sitting here and talking and everything. So, you know, we have um, 
you know, Jenna, in almost every area that you are, if you if you contact your librarians, they can tell you what writer groups are, are in the area. That's the beautiful thing about resource librarians. They're wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to write in a vacuum. It's always good to find, or find that feedback loop. Because, I mean, in essence, writing is a very lonely job. I mean, it could be a very lonely thing, right? But it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, and then you, if you want to grow as a writer, you got to have some of that feedback loop and have like some people who will tell you, girl, I don't know about that plot. Um, <laughs> or girl, I don't know about that character. Um, that's, that's good. You're going to, and as you go, you know, you'll, you'll gain a thicker skin and that is totally needed because that's part of your growth. Like the more that you learn, you'll get a little bit tougher. Um, you'll be able to take feedback. And then you'll start learning too, like which feedback is valid and what feedback you're like, eh, I appreciate the feedback that you would agree to salt. But that that comes with you just getting in there and just growing from it. I tell people all the time that no matter what um, an editor says or your critique group says, none of that is going to be worse than what they do on Amazon. So just get ready for it. Take that initial <laughs> You know, or, or Goodreads. Goodreads pulls I don't, no I don't go around there. I don't go around Goodreads at all. I sometimes <laughs> have to. I, I go across an Amazon interview, but you know, I know for early writers, again, the one who thought her words were gold, it was so hard to see that, you know, the critiquing, you know, five page uh, revision letter from my editor, Single Space, the first time that was so hard to take. But I learned so much from that. So just be open to that and open to critiquing, um, you know, people critiquing your work because it's going to come no matter what. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's a journey. All of this, everything you're doing, you're setting off on this great adventure and it's a, it's a lot of fun, but I, I love karma when you brought up about, you know, it's a, it's a lonely uh, kind of career and people have asked me, they said, how are you doing the pandemic? And I'm like, I feel like the rest of the world is joining me. Because my life has been in my office with imaginary people in my head talking to myself. And now y'all are with me. You're on board. <laughs> we have another question. This one's from Meg. Uh, Sophie talked about a surprise series. Do any of you have side characters you didn't expect uh, that surprised you with a story of their own? For me all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I write a lot of series. They always start out as three book series. Um, and I think one has been a six book, another eight book, no, two eight book series. All of them, again, starting out as three. But the, the one that surprised me the most was the series that I wrote for Harlequin, um, my Bayou Dream series, that I thought was going to be three books. And um, after I turned in the third book, about a week later, my editor asked me if I was going to turn my book in. And I actually thought that she had lost uh, the email. And that's when I learned that they actually wanted me to continue the series and they wanted to do it with the back to back release um, where one book was coming out in April and the next one in May. So I had five months to write. I'm sorry, five weeks five weeks to write this next book. So, and I, I just had no idea because I had lost an editor and it got, the information got lost, but my agent was like, you know, this is a really big thing if they want you to do this. So if you can, so I had to find a character because <laughs> I had already wrapped up the series in a bow. Um, and I just, I just went in and I was like, okay, this one who has the coffee shop, she looks good. And there she is. <laughs> she's book four. Um, and again, it's, it's, you know, it's a six book series. Uh, but yeah, you find you, you make, you make stories. You can take anyone. The mailman can be your hero in your next book. If you give him a personality and a backstory, it's what you do as an author. So it mm -hmm. happens. Um, so I have a question. Uh, so this is probably a difficult one. No one can ever answer it. I ask this all the time. Um, do you have a favorite book or series that you have written? And and we'll start with Kathy. Oh, all right, I, I'll go. Ahead. Uh, my favorite book is the is the second book I ever wrote, and the title of it is Treasured Vows. 
And um, the reason that it's one of my favorites, is I love this character, Phaedra Abbott. And Phaedra is a woman who um, she is going to succeed no matter what. Um, she feels abandoned. She's going to create the life that she never had. And she's going to go out. And I think that's very true of all uh, heroines of any book. Uh, we hit them at the point where they're deciding to pick up the reins of their life and to make it for themselves. But I remember uh, the reason I like this book uh, so much is that there was a young girl. And I was living in Virginia at the time. And there was a young girl. She was like 10 years old. And she'd been abused and abandoned in a ditch by her family. And she drowned in the water in the ditch. And I read this news story and it just, I mean, it grabbed my heart. I, I was so horrified and I was starting this book and I thought, I'm going to name this character for Phaedra. In fact, I, I get dinged every once in a while because it's spelled P-H-A-D-R-A -A instead of the P-H-A-E-R-A-E-D or whatever. But I wanted to write for this one because I wanted, I wanted this Phaedra, Phaedra to find the life of her dreams. I wanted her to succeed. And so to this day, still, I just, I love this character. Um, and I always think of that story. Okay, fair. Um, I, I don't really go back and read any of my books. So the only, the, I guess my two favorites would be the only ones that I've gone back and reread just for pleasure. Um, but if I had to pick one out of it, it would be a little bit naughty from my Moments in Maplesville series. Um, and it's a it's my favorite because when I was writing it, the chemistry between the characters, that book basically wrote itself because the chemistry just hopped off the page. Um, the heroine is, um, she has, she sells sex toys for a living. She, she throws these parties. And she's, you know, divorced and down on her luck. So that's kind of why she's doing it. And the hero is actually the older brother of one of her good friends. And he's this very stuffy attorney. And he thinks that she is just corrupting his little sister. And um, but you learn that he always had a crush on her in high school, um, even though he treated her, you know, like he just didn't like her all this time. And it was just one of those kind of like an enemies to lovers, like Sophie talked about. Um, but only one of them was really, you know, the enemy because he was secretly in love with her. But it, it again, I've gone back and read it more than once. And for someone who actually, you know, kind of gets physically ill, when I have to go back and look at one of my books just for research, <laughs> and then, uh, that says a lot. So, yeah, a little bit naughty. Jada and Mason are my favorite characters I've ever written. Okay, Karma? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I I think, I feel like you've asked me this question before, too. So, um, <laughs> the last time we met and I had a, a struggle to think of the answer, but I would say, um, yeah, two, two of my books. So, um, Selenium Night definitely is one of my favorites because one, um, I just, I loved creating the relationship between Aiden and Maddie. I think that was the first time it was like super sweet relationship and just kind of kiss met. Um, I also am, I think I caused myself a lot more problems writing um, as a challenge because I love secondary characters. Um, I my my problem is I try to want to make so many of them like multifaceted and strong and you just don't have enough time in the book for that. Um, but I think for Selenium Night, there are a number of secondary characters that had very strong personalities because I wanted to give them a lot of um, reasonable backstory and give them some dimension uh, because a lot of the theme around Selenium Night was around family and your family doesn't necessarily have to be blood. Um, and, you know, everyone has their their family issues and can kind of skyrocket into something like catastrophic if you're not careful. Uh, but, yeah, that's I would say that's my favorite. I've read that one another time before. Um, but I didn't even expect that I would like Kiss of the Fallen as much as I did. I did end up reading that recently again. 
And I really love um, Zoe. She is just, she's just so badass. Like if, if I, if, if I wanted to make that, if that ever got turned into a movie, like the actress who plays um, as Mazakine on Lucifer would be perfect for Zoe, just completely badass and unapologetic. And uh, I just, I fell in love with writing her character so much. So I think that those are my favorite too. Sophie? And you, I remembered this time. Um, I don't, you know, I, I'm going to look at behind me at my shelf. For <laughs> just close your eyes and pick one. I know. Uh, it, I just, like, look where I try. I did something different. Um, and I do, I, I do write in different genres. And I've shot. So my very first young adult I ever published was very meaningful for me. Um, it was the first book I ever wrote in first person. It was featuring, everything was different. It was paranormal, but it was still a love story. It was a trilogy. I, the first book just, I mean, I just blew through it, you know, writing it. And um, those books always hold a special place for me. I still get a lot of um, fan mail, especially from my Latin American Spanish readers. Uh, it had such a big following down there. I went to Argentina for their book festival for it. And it's just amazing when I still get tagged by um, those readers for this book with, you know, the pretty pictures where they pose the book. I'm like, still, they're talking about these books. Um, and sometimes I get emails and they ask me questions about them. And I'm like, you probably read it or reread it a week ago. I haven't written that. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> Looks better than I do at this point, but um, that is definitely a favorite. Um, I did uh, my new adult writing um, foreplay. The first book in my new adult series was really like I, I laugh about that one because it's everything that happened to me in college combined <laughs> with everything I wished happened to me in college. <laughs> So I love, I, I, I blew through the writing process of that book too. My husband read that book and he was like, it felt like it was like us. And I'm like, it was kind of like us. And plus <laughs> it was like us um, on steroids, babe. <laughs> but but um, I had, a, so Foreplay, the Firelight Trilogy. Um, it was interesting hearing you talk, Kathy, about reading something that, resonated and had an impact on you and you know just affected you and bothered you so much um as far as my historical romances go there's a fairy tale called um gosh I forgot I think it's something the beggar princess and it's an old fairy tale and uh Shana Galen gave my daughter for her birthday a book of like fairy tales from all around the world so I can't even really remember what country it came from but it was a different country um, where this beggar princess, her father arranges a marriage with a young man of rank, a position. And he, the father's like the king of beggars. Like he doesn't have, you know, he has wealth, but he has no rank or position. So the, her, he arranges his daughter's marriage to this young man of rank. And the young man of rank is mortified. Like he's marrying the beggar princess. He's not happy about it, but he, he needs the money and his family needs the money. So he marries this girl and then he throws her overboard the night of their wedding off the wedding crew, off a wedding barge. They were on this ship. So she washes ashore and is rescued by this loving couple who take her in, mend her to health, raise her as their daughter and then one day arrange for her marriage and they're all veiled in the wedding and she doesn't know. So she's, she goes to get married and it turns out she marries the same guy who threw her overboard on the night of her wedding. <laughs> and now he realizes, well, she's kind of become this adopted daughter of the emperor and the empress who love her like their own. And so he drops to his knees and he's sorry and they live happily ever after. And I remember closing this book and turning to my five-year-old daughter and saying, honey, we never live happily ever after. We never <laughs> this isn't what happens. And it always made such an impression on me that I wrote 
Um, how to lose a bride in one night, <laughs> where the heroine is thrown overboard on her wedding night and she washes ashore and the hero rescues her. This is one of those rare books where like your heroine is married to somebody else through the bulk of the story. She didn't, they didn't consummate the marriage because her husband tried to kill her before that happened. But um, I wrote this story. I think there's an author's note where I talked about the fairy tale and how I was like, you know what? I've got to retell this story the right way. <laughs> I'm going to get it right. <laughs> so in historicals, that's one of my favorites, I think. It's horrifying. I cannot believe that was uh, supposed to be fun. Some of those or Really? <laughs> um, oh, we're running out of time. This is so sad. Um, but I want to know, uh, and so does one of our audience members, um, what are you working on right now? What can we look forward to uh, in 2021? Well, I'll go with it. Uh, I'm continuing um, the Logical Men's Society's um, Guide to Dangerous Women. And in um, 2021, in June, uh, I will have out uh, her first desire. I love it. These are really like old school titles. So it, so we had his secret mistress. Now we go to her first desire, and then in the following year, it's going to be his lessons on love. And uh, so we'll, we'll continue on in this same vein. So I'm having a very good time with all of this. Um, I have the next book in my series. Uh, it's called The Dating Playbook. It'll be out late summer 2021. Uh, that's the next year, right? We're in 2020. Uh, <laughs> Shows you where my mind is. <laughs> what year is this? I should never forget. Um, but yeah, it is for someone who has read The Boyfriend Project. This one is um, Taylor's story. She is the youngest of my trio of women. Um, and she is a kind of an Instagram fitness guru, or she's trying to become one. Um, and in this story, she meets a old Texas Longhorn who <laughs> was in, uh, he was in the NFL. And again, it's set in, it's actually set in Georgetown and Austin. Um, but he was injured and he is trying to get back into the NFL. So he needs a personal trainer. And Taylor becomes his personal trainer. And it's kind of a, if we're talking tropes, it's kind of a fake dating story. They kind of have to start fake dating to hide a secret that he has. So uh, I love tropes. I love this trope. So I had a ton of fun writing it. And it'll be out next year. Will you also be doing London? Yes, I actually, London's book, uh, London's book was actually my nano book that I started on Sunday, uh, but then I got the revisions for Taylor's book on Monday. So I, <laughs> I did one day nano uh, and it's like, once again, I'm not going to finish because revisions have cut me dead. But uh, London book is going to be the one that wraps it all up. And I truly believe that this series will actually remain a three book series, which may be the first one I've ever written that has only been the three books that I have. Hey, Karma? <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, plans for next year. So I have a novella that's going to be releasing in January called Beef of Hearts. And uh, because <laughs> I got restless, what was it, maybe a year and a half ago, and I think this one I really got stump on uh, one of my series, well, my Shadow Shifter series, and I was just like, oh, I'm just not feeling this particular story. So I had created um, another novella that I just kind of puts around with and then I end up falling in love with it like as most times it happens when you start playing around experimenting uh but um I liked the idea of using some of history and I think that I got some of that from Miss Bev she likes to use things around history to kind of give you a history lesson on top of her amazing book and I had read across a um story about um integration in Las Vegas and when did it happen and there was a casino called Moulin Rouge, which was the first integrated casino on the Strip. 
Um, it was one of those uh, events that later on had triggered uh, integration throughout the whole Las Vegas Strip, because prior to that, um, you, if you were black and brown, you were not allowed to be in the Los casinos. So I wanted to create a story where it's like, what if we had this demon? And he was a greed demon, and he really gets his energy and kicks from having a casino. And of course, he would have an integrated casino because he doesn't care about what color the skin they are. He just cares about money, and money is green. That's the only color that he cares about. Um, and I have a succubus who wants to join a demon hunting group. They're pretty sanct sanctimonious, um, but she really wants to find a place to belong. Um, and so her task is to uh, find this artifact that is located deep in the heart of this mysterious first integrated uh, casino on the strip, which i uh, really excited to share with people because I really enjoyed writing that one. <laughs> So amazingly enough, I, um, I'll just start by saying I'm chronically late for my deadlines, <laughs> but they built, they're so kind. My editor is very kind. I know they built in a cushion. No one should have ever told me that, that they built in, it. they have a built-in cushion. Yes. Um, <laughs> we'll never tell you that. <laughs> like, oh, I'm good. I'm going to give it to you when I get it done. But, um, you know, things are a little more different during this pandemic, a little more critical to be on time because there's, you know, printing issues, less printers. And it's more like, hey, you could you got to be on time. And if you're not on and she was kind enough to give me a heads up. So I was on time and I turned it in on Monday, which I was really glad I turned it in on Monday because I've been, you know, glued to the meet, you know, the news. Anyway, I would have been useless come Tuesday morning. But um I turned it in on Monday and it will be out. It's an August release. And are y'all ready for the title? It's, it just, I turned in this title as a, you know, when they ask you when it's time to cover conference and you send your thoughts for your cover and you send your title suggestions. I sent this kind of buried in the middle of like eight suggestions. And in the parentheses, I wrote, ha, like with an exclamation point like this. I always throw in a joke title, like for, um, the one where the bride gets thrown overboard, I called it Bride Overboard, ha! Huh? And she, <laughs> I mean, they didn't name it Bride Overboard, right? So I snuck this one in the middle of my suggestions with a ha huh! after the end, and this is the one they picked. <laughs> and they loved it. The name of the book coming out next summer is called The Duke Goes Down. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> And I didn't even get it at first till everybody started laughing. I'm like, oh no, I got it. <laughs> did anybody else not get it? I thought that was cheeky and too naughty, and they won't go for it. But it shows what you know. <laughs> that's a promise, and that that's a promise. There's no, okay, there's no language, no profanity in the title. They're like, it should be just fine. If any accounts push back, we'll let you know. But so far, it's up now on all tail sites listed. <laughs> First book of a new series. Um, and and it's not just for the, I mean, it came to me as a funny thing, but the premise of that book, that it's a duke that learns he is actually illegitimate. He's lived his whole life as the heir apparent. And his father passed away, and then he was actually a Duke for several years. It comes out that he was born before they were married. So he loses everything, and he's like living in his mother's dower house, trying to get his life together. I mean, he's like that modern day, you know, guy living in his mom's basement. That's and just like trying to figure out his life because of what happened. And, uh, so he's not your traditional, he definitely, it works. The title, The Duke Goes Down, works. Because he. the book opens, I like, obviously, I think we all probably have this in common. We're writing a little bit of an underdog. Our heroes or heroines are starting, you know, low. And they've got to work themselves up to whatever goal they have. And, uh, his goal is just trying to find get some semblance of a story. And then the heroine is um, the vicar's daughter, but her father's kind of senile. So she 
she's actually been running the vicarage, writing all the sermons. So she's essentially a lady vicar, uh, which I've wanted to write a lady vicar for a long time. So I'm excited. That's that. Uh, that's that August, July 27th. Uh, and then I have my first not in May. That's my very first Regency young adult novel. Oh. I'm excited. I wish I had the covers out. If y'all look at my cover, it's a, it's a graphic cover and it's, it's adorable and it's called 16 scandals because my heroine does turn 16 at the beginning of the book and it, it's a kind of a nod a wink to 16 candles in that um she celebrates her birthday and her family knows it's her birthday they just don't really care because they're so focused on her sister who's about to get married <laughs> Seems like a very Regency thing that would happen. Like, we're just sort of pushing. I know you want to come out right now, honey, and go to all the balls, but we got to pay attention to and get through your sister's wedding. So that's, uh, she sneaks out. The book takes place basically in 24 hours. She sneaks out with a friend and spends a night in Foxhall Gardens. So that's 21. <laughs> 2021. Yay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Thank you all for joining me tonight. Thank you to everyone who attended. Um, thanks to the friends of the library for providing all the prizes that we're going to be giving away. I'll be contacting all of our attendees and giving you details on how to pick up the books. Um, we'll also be posting this on our YouTube if you all want to share it with your friends. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much for doing this. This is a wonderful event. We always look forward to it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone.